Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Stetschist, and I am the director of Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Toronto, and I'm super excited to welcome you to tonight's event. Today, we have a very special event co-presented for the first time in the history of Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies with the Baltimore Hebrew Institute at Towson University, and we're very excited to partner with BHI for this event, and I'd like to thank Professor Jill Max, who is, uh, uh, you can see right here, uh, Director of Baltimore Hebrew Institute for her partnership. I would also like to acknowledge that this event is uh, co-sponsored by the Rose and Ralph Halbert Fund in Jewish Studies. And thanks to Mrs. Uh, Rose Halbert and her late husband, Ms. Mr. Ralph Halbert, for their generous donation, which has allowed us to host excellent events on Jewish thought and philosophy for many years. Today's panel is entitled Judaism and Heresy, the case of Spinoza, Freud, and Chernikovsky. We will hear from three incredible scholars, our panelists, Professor Robert Alter from Berkeley, Professor Willie Gutschel, our colleague from University of Toronto, and Professor Gilad Sharbit uh, from Towson University. And we will also hear a special word of welcome from Professor Vivian uh, Liska, who is the uh, editor of the series. So the panel is in celebration of the publication of this volume called Canonization and Alter uh, Alterity, Heresy in Jewish History, Thought and Literature, which just came out in 2020. And soon you will see a big uh, photograph of the book cover. Uh, the book was edited by uh, our two panelists, uh, Professor Gilad Sharvit and uh, Professor Willie Gottschall, and it is a 14th volume in the series called Perspective of Jewish Texts and Context, which is edited by Professor Vivian Lisk. Now, I feel like it's a personal gathering of friends here. Uh, Professor Liska was just here in Toronto short five years ago, and we enjoyed the, this incredible talk and also an opportunity to be in that one room together and discuss uh, uh, exciting developments in Jewish studies. Uh, Professor Robert Alter was also here not so long ago, two years ago, and uh, we enjoyed uh, listening about his new project on the uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, and uh, I have to say there is something really special about seeing you are panelists here on Zoom screen, and I really hope that one day we will resume that conversation in person somehow with new ideas approaching uh, and developing. I also want to say that it is a special pleasure for me to support this book, co-edited by Willie Gottschall, who has been my colleague here at the University of Toronto for the past 20 years, and also my office neighbor, yeah, I know Willie, <laughs> 20 years, uh, and my office neighbor for the first 10 years of it. And I have always been in awe of his scholarship in Jewish philosophy and his works on Spinoza, Goldschmidt, Heine, and German Jewish literature and philosophy. Really, congratulations on this book and that to you and Gilad. And now I, am, uh, uh, I will pass on the microphone to Professor Benjamin Fischer, who will moderate this event. So before I do, let me just introduce the prof Professor Fisher to you. He has earned his uh, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and his BA from the University of Toronto. So uh, Professor Fisher, welcome back, so to say. Um, he joined the history department of Towson University in 2011, and he has been a visiting fellow at Oxford and Harvard. Uh, he is a specialist in social, intellectual, and cultural history of Jewish society in medieval and early modern Europe. He is also the author of uh, Amsterdam's People of the Book, Jewish Society and the Turn to Scripture in the 17th Century, which came out, just also came out from Hebrew Union's College Press uh, in 2020. So, Professor Fisher, take it away. Thank you very much, Anna, for your opening remarks um, for introducing today's panel. Um, it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our three distinguished speakers who will be having a conversation about Judaism and heresy in the cases of Spinoza, Freud, and Chernikovsky. Um, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Robert Alter joining us today from UC Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Alter is Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at Berkeley and is a member of numerous learned societies, including the American Philosophical Society and the Council of Scholars of the Library of Congress. He has been a senior fellow at the National Endowment for the Humanities, 
um, a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem and an Old Dominion fellow at Princeton University. He has been a Guggenheim fellow twice. It's a great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Alter join us today speaking about Chernikovsky. Our second distingu very distinguished speaker is Dr. Willy Gottschall, professor of German uh, and philosophy at the University of Toronto. Dr. Gottschall is a leading scholar of modern Jewish thought and the impressive catalog of his publications testifies to the breadth of his interests and his expertise. His works include Heine and Critical Theory, The Discipline of Philosophy and the Invention of Modern Jewish Thought, Spinoza's Modernity and Constituting Critique, Kant's Writing as Critical Praxis. Dr. Gocho will be speaking about the notion of heresy in Spinoza's writings and the image of Spinoza in modern Jewish thought this afternoon. Our third distinguished speaker this afternoon is Dr. Gilad Sharvit. Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Towson University um, and my colleague. Dr. Sharvit completed his doctorate at uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Before coming to Towson, um, he held prestigious postdoctoral fellowships at UC Berkeley's Townsend Center for Humanities and the Center for Jewish Studies. Dr. Sharvit is the author of a forthcoming book, Therapeutics and Salvation, Freud and Schelling on Freedom, Dr. Sh um, he is also the editor and contributor to Freud and Monotheism, The Violent Origins of Religion. In collaboration with uh, Willy Gottschall, Dr. Sharvit is, an ed is, is one of the editors and a contributing author to the volume that we are discussing today, Canonization and Alterity, Heresy in Jewish History, Thought, and Literature. We're very honored to have Dr. Sharvit, Dr. Gottschall, and Dr. Alter joining us today. Um, through the miraculous meeting uh, place of Zoom. Um, any members of the audience, incidentally, who are interested in purchasing uh, canonization and alterity um, will have the option to do so with a 20% um, publisher's discount um, using um, the ordering information online that will be shared, I believe, on the screen um, that everyone can see, um, and also, um, I believe, in the chat. It is now my sincere pleasure to invite uh, Professor Vivian Liska, the editor of the series in which canonization and alterity appears, um, to offer some remarks um, regarding the, the volume and, uh, and the editors. So I turn the microphone over to Dr. Liska. Thank you so much. Actually, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank all those who have made this uh, possible. Um, this event for the publication of the volume, Canonization and Alterity, Heresy in Jewish History, Thought and Literature, allows me to say thank you uh, to just the people who have uh, contributed to it so much, Ulrike Kraus and Katja Leming uh, from the staff at the Greuter, but above all, I want to express my admiration and thanks to Gilad Chavit and Billy Gertschel for the extraordinary book that is now the 14th uh, volume in the series, Perspectives on Jewish Texts and Contexts. They have produced this with so much ingenuity, intellectual drive and erudition. A lot of work and effort went into gathering so many different voices from such superb scholars. So thanks, Willy and Gilad, for bringing this insightful and thought-provoking volume to completion. It is also an opportunity, Gilad, to apologize for my initial doubts that this could be done. Bringing all these diverse forms of heresy together at first seemed to me a risky task in the face of a specialized field as Jewish studies. So it is now a sheer pleasure to see between two covers discussions about heresy and Kafka, Bulafia, Isaac Bashevis Singer, Derrida, Tchernikovsky, Spinoza, uh, and more. And I on purpose threw them all together without chronology or order uh, because it really shows that you did it. You and Willy, thank you just so much. And thank you to all the speakers who are here. I'm delighted. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Lewis uh, I'm just waiting for Benjamin to turn on his microphone. <laughs> I, I can't there we go. There we go. Um, so um, uh, with, uh, without further ado, I think it, it's time to turn our attention and, and, well, uh, and begin with our, um, the, the stars of our show, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Gottschall, Dr. Sharvin, uh, uh, and Dr. Alter. Um, I wonder if, uh, um, I, I don't know if the three speakers had worked out an order between them, but perhaps it might make sense for Dr. Gottschall to, um, to begin our, uh, our panel as the um, speaker on his home turf and, uh, and as the speaker on the earliest uh, um, chronological subject. Okay, yes, thank you very much also um, to U of T and everybody there and to Towson for organizing this terrific Zoom. So of course I don't have a home turf anymore, we're all in cyberspace. Um, but um, what we did is I will first just give you a little bit of a um, discussion, just a few a minute or two, what the conception of the book is. And if Natasha can pull it up, otherwise I like show and tell. <laughs> oh yeah, you have it there. Um, so if you get the get the cover, yes. And um, so you have to. Uh, I show you also here the this beautiful beautiful picture. So this is a this depiction of Helios, yes, the son of God. Uh, the, sorry, the sun god, <laughs> that was a Freudian maybe, uh, the sun god of Greek mythology. And this is found in a flow mosaic of the synagogue in Hamad Tiberius. So first of all, this would seem to go against the prohibition of the depiction of a human image. And second, this is not just a human image, but it's actually the image of a Greek deity. So how much more damage could you possibly do? So some scholars um, I found have actually argued that this is just a symbolic representation of the sun and therefore kosher. However, whatever you wish to say, there is no two ways about it that this is still an image and actually a very lively and cheerful at that, you know, rosy cheeks and all of a person at best, but a Greek God or deity at worst. So it's a problem. We chose this example for our cover because it captures something of what the book seeks to highlight. That is, it serves as a great illustration how Jewish tradition actually works, literally on the ground. This is a mosaic in on the ground, in the ground. A sign that a tradition lives and lives on is how a tradition deals with in and exclusion. That is, that is how well it is able to allow for and embrace internal difference, the otherness that drives any creative human force. Rather than shunning cultural difference and relying on exclusion to establish a pre and preserve Jewish tradition, the essays of this book we collected show the Jewish tradition has been most creative, promising, and powerful when its internal differences were no longer silenced and repressed, but allowed articulation, when they were recognized as the powerful sources that brought Jewish tradition to life. The point we try to make in this book is that the life of tradition is most alive and most generative only where a tradition is able to creatively address and appreciate the internal differences that make it possible in the first place. It is on this otherness within on which a vital tradition can build its continuity rather than on a recipe of exclusion and internal regulation. Where the dynamic of this tension is no longer palpable, a tradition is no longer alive. This volume looks at the very long history, a very long history of the phenomenon, how from antiquity to today, that is from Hellenism to, the, to today's academic study of Judaism, so-called heretic impulses have provided to be the generative force that has kept Judaism alive, creative and transformative. From Rabbi Elijah ben Abuya, 
the Achel, that is uh, the literal author, to the Kabbalists and to Spinoza, to Chernichovsky, Kafka, Isaac Beshevi's singer, Freud and Derrida, this volume tracks the often provocative but at the same time inspiring lineage of heretical thinking and demonstrates, we hope, how its contribution is to be understood as a decisive, vital, and indispensable aspect of Jewish tradition. So now I turn to uh, my little hobby horse, Spinoza, and uh, what I look in my text is um, Spinoza, the question of heresy, and the discourse of modernity, how um, they interweave. So in my essay, actually what I did is that I track two themes or two strains or threads, and they are first how Spinoza figures in the narrative of Jewish history, the history of philosophy, and of the history of modernity more generally. That is how he, track, how he figures there as a hero on the one side, uh, a heretic on the other, and how his inex and exclusion has served the foundational function of those narratives. That's the one part. The other part is um, I'm looking at Spinoza's, I track Spinoza's own views, if that's not already heretic, on the question of heresy itself. And of course, um, the point of my essay is that they actually interweave these two things, but uh, they interweave in strange ways, um, often to the degree that people fant like to fantasize about the, uh, uh, about the story and rarely read the text. Nothing that is so unusual for literary um, uh, academic scholars, of course. So the narratives we tell ourselves are are also the narratives of what we don't tell. And that's what I'm interested in. That is what we leave out, ignore and silence. And so in a weird way, as Spinoza's reception is extremely rich and detailed, lots of details we know are imagined, made up and fantasized. And the most important thing, as we also know as literary scholars and philosophers are often the, 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 the little tiny details that are not told, not mentioned, obscured, and that you find in little tiny footnotes if you look for it. So uh, for Jews or for, for the Jewish discourse, he has, uh, Spinoza has become a shibboleth of in and exclusion, either you're for him or you're against him, okay? So there's this oppositions, it's either religious, uh, either it uh, it's splits the religious from the secular, the traditional from the progressive, the conservative from the revolutionary, and you could go on if you want. Um, but these are just a few of these oppositions along which Spinoza serves as a make marker for Jewish self-identification. I'm not saying whether they're correct distinctions, but that's how the discourse functions. A similar phenomenon can be observed in the general reception of Spinoza. And of course, the two, the Jewish and the non-Jewish reception of Spinoza cannot easily be, they cannot be easily disentangled. More than that, they actually intermingle, they, they, they constitute each other reciprocally. So while people think they are split, they're actually in an interesting way, you, um, like, producing each other even, or driving each other. So the problem, of course, is that we always already look at Spinoza through this lens, but it's a lens he didn't uh, produce himself, he was a lens maker, but a lens that we volunteer and impose on him. We choose to s see him as a hero or a heretic, or even worse maybe, as a he heretic who has become a hero. And this is actually a problem, I think, so the story about Spinoza is really more the story about ourselves then. But at this point, at the latest, we need to ask ourselves, have we been led by our own mirage? That is by Spinoza we've made in our own image? Or biblically speaking, are we the heretics because we make an image, an idol of somebody who wasn't an idol, didn't want to ever be one? Of course, I'm not going to pretend that behind the screen of image imaginary projections, we can find the one and only authoritative view on Spinoza. 
What I can offer, however, is simply to go back to his writings and produce at least a richer understanding of what he actually has written. Now, what makes Spinoza so unique is that he formulates one of the first modern and radically thoughtful theories of interpretations, that is a theory of how to read and how to make sense of writing. His theological political treatise is a sophisticated approach to hermeneutic and political theory. More precisely, it's a critical discussion of how interpretation and politics interconnect and inseparably so. So his point is in short, that um, interpretation is always political and politics is always produced by interpretation and you can't keep them ap apart. So to sum up Spinoza's point, standing as it were, as we like to say on one foot, one could say Spinoza's heresy is to have argued that hermeneutically speaking, if we are true to what scripture itself says, there is no heresy. Spinoza never saw himself as a heretic because the idea of heresy presupposes the idea that the Jewish traditions, and I like to talk in the plural if I talk about Jewish traditions, have doctrinal contents that are binding. Spinoza's theory of interpretation, however, throws any such claims into principal doubts. Unlike your run-of-the-mill heretic, Spinoza did thus not argue or propose another reading, another view or opinion about any possible doctrinal content. More radically, much more radically, he challenged the whole idea that the scripture held such doctrinal content as a delusion about how faith, religion, and tradition actually works. The problem with his reception has been that this move is still understood in terms of the conventional herme hermeneutics, that is the practice of regulated institutionalized interpretation that reduces scripture to normative content, that is to instructions to follow an established catalog of theologically motivated norms and rules. This has been a scandal because rather than being held captive to reactive argumentation, Spinoza has challenged the claims to ownership of scriptural truth on its very own terms as an ultimately problematic, if not fatal, short-circuiting of theological and political thinking. The tension between these two aspects, that is his reception and his thought as we know it, or as we tell it to each other, has produced a storyline of Spinoza as the heretic, even the ringleader of heretics, or the heretics of all heretics. I think it is time, or it has maybe time for a while, to recognize that even celebrating him as a hero because we wish to see him as the exemplary heretic remains in the final analysis a questionable move of subjecting him to our own fantasy and instrumentalizing him for exactly the kind of purposes, let's call it assimilizations, he so resolutely fought against. So that's my sort of on one chair sitting little story. So I pass it on to um, that, I guess to Professor Alter then, yes? Oh, yes. Thank you. I actually would, would like to reinforce and uh, extend Professor Goetschel's um, proposal that, that heresy may not be a valid concept, at least for Jewish tradition. And I think the case of Chernochovsky uh, really illustrates this. Now, he had a rather atypical background for a Hebrew writer starting out around the turn of the 20th century. It, he grew up not in a shtetl, and I would say not in a strictly orthodox home. That, that is, they observed the traditional regulations. His father did it out of a sense of obligation to tradition. His mother evidently w was not particularly religious at all. Uh, his first language was not Yiddish, but, but uh, 
Russian, uh, and uh, all his life he was rather contemptuous of the Hebrew writers in Russia who spoke the language with a Yiddish accent and made certain mistakes in, in idioms. He was utterly Russian. Uh, but what I tried to uh, argue in, in my essay is that his paganism was not merely a rhetorical gesture, but something quite authentic. Now, I want to take the paganism back to, to his background in the Hebrew Bible for a couple of minutes. We now know, scholarship knows, uh, that um, Israelite belief in the biblical period, we could push the argument in our volume back to the Bible, although we didn't, that Israelite belief in the biblical period was uh, not one thing. That is, there, there was official religion and there was popular religion. And there is every, every ev evidence, some of it in the Bible itself, a lot of it archaeological, that uh, the popular religion uh, was highly syncretistic, that it was okay to worship Yahweh, but there were other gods as well. They were very appealing, and maybe especially the goddesses. Now, Chernochovsky tapped into this, really. Um, he was a passionately loyal Jew uh, and really an ardent Zionist nationalist. But at the same time, he uh, really rejected the idea of worshiping one God or of the prescriptive authority of Jewish tradition. At times he felt a certain tension with, with uh, his Hebrew reading audience. That is, in, in one well-known poem, he says, Neta zar haitil ami. That is, I, I was a, um, an alien plant to my people. But he stuck by his guns. And I think that, that the um, corona of interlocking sonnets on which my essay chiefly focused is a brilliant illustration of this and for my money one of the best longer poems written in any language in the 20th century. That is it puts together all kinds of things. The, the, uh, the story of the poet, uh, the value of art in the modern world, um, uh, the pantheistic, vitalistic vision of, of reality uh, th that um, Chernikovsky had, and even uh, toward the end, modern science. So he, he was a doctor, he was interested in, in taxonomies and all kinds of other things. So one of the reasons why uh, these sonnets and a few others that, that Janikowski wrote are such a powerful uh, expression of a pantheistic worldview is the language. Because he really couldn't do this in another language. He, he tapped into the Hebrew of the Bible, but not just uh, all elements of the Hebrew of the Bible. Mostly it's the poetic, archaic uh, uh, elements of the bi uh, biblical Hebrew that he marshals in his poetry. Also, quite notably, there are very, very few biblical allusions. That is, there are memorable biblical phrases in his poetry but they're not illusions. Now this runs counter to the whole direction of Hebrew poetry until I would say the 1970s. Uh, why is this so? Well, Chernochovsky was not interested 
in latching on to the Bible, getting a kind of free ride from the Bible, evoking resonances from the Bible, but rather in creating in his Hebrew an alternate reality to the Bible, almost as if you might say theologically or ideologically, the Bible had never e existed. And he can do this by particularly deploying the archaic elements of the Hebrew language that were so important in, in biblical poetry. And by doing this, he takes us back to a whole ancient Near Eastern world, a, a world w where um, a, a, a young woman uh, seeking e either a lover or a, um, a child that's not clear which, uh, offers uh, a sacrifice to a love goddess. Uh, it, it's, and he's a, an equal opportunity pantheist also. Uh, th that is, in, in his poetry, in, especially in, in the To the Sun cycle, you find uh, the gods of ancient Egypt, the, the Norse gods, the gods of, uh, of China, because he sees all of these as a manifestation of a response to reality. I would say, if it doesn't sound pretentious, or a response to the cosmos uh, in, in which the inherent vitalism of existence, it's pulsating life, a life that pulsates even in the, the violence of the battlefield is manifest and different cultures in different ages offer it due accord. Um, for, uh, for that reason, that there, there's something very universal about uh, th this sequence of poems and this whole aspect of Chernochovsky's undertaking uh, because he doesn't see the world as limited to a, a Jewish perspective. And in fact, he has some harsh polemic things to say against monotheism. Uh, he, he thinks the, that uh, Monotheism has obscured the vital gods of nature to, to whom we owe obeisance. And um, I would say that in a strange way, th this uh, very pagan poetry is also very Jewish. And that seems to me the paradoxical greatness of Shaul Chernichovsky. Um, so I'll take from here. I take it from here. Yeah. Um, okay. So thank you uh, so much, uh, 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 Professor Alter and, and Gertrude. Uh, I, I want to uh, say a few words uh, and thank you if you don't, if you allow me, uh, just let me. So I, I want to first thank uh, 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 Vivian, who supported this project from the very uh, early stages. I remember especially a conversation we had in Berkeley, we just talked about uh, but this conversation, and this was a few years back, and I, when I pitched her the idea of the book, and she accepted it almost immediately, and as a young postdoc, I was really impressed with this, so thank you, Vivian, for your support, and I want to thank, really, uh, I don't have many opportunity, opportunities to say that, but I learned a lot from working with you, and I'm grateful for your help, and more importantly, for your friendship. I want to thank uh, Professor uh, uh, Alter, who was one of the first, I think, to accept our invitation to contribute to this volume. And Willie and I really deeply appreciate your wonderful wor work. And I want to thank all the other contributors, just to mention them by name. There are Eric Bruin, Adil Schremer, Shraga Baon, Eugene Matanki, Moshe Idel, Ruth uh, Kara Ivanov Kaniel, David uh, Zohuf, Noam Gil, Shaul Magid, and Agatha Bialik Robson, all great minds whose work really changes our understanding of heresy in Jewish history and thought and literature. And, and I want to thank the team at the Greuther for their help. Uh, and lastly, to the wonderful work of Jill and Diane, 
at uh, the BHI and Anna and Lorraine from Toronto in organizing this event and for event for moderating it. Okay, so uh, now to Freud. And uh, I don't think it will be a, a shock to, to anyone here today if I'll say that Freud probably be featured in any list of Jewish heretics in modernity. And this is not because Freud, uh, only because Freud was not an Orthodox Jew, nor because he did not know Hebrew or, and very seldom, if ever, went to the synagogue, but mostly because of a series of works he published in the 1910s and 20s that were extremely critical of the basic religious worldview. And to, to shortly remind us, he argued in Totem and Taboo that religion is an invention of primitive minds, and in The Future of Illusion, he further argued that religion is an illusion of fearful humanity who invented God as the father figure to safeguard us from nature and death. And both books, I think, at least for me personally, are dwarfed compared to Freud's earliest essay on religion from 1908, where he equates between religious ritual and obsessive compulsive behavior. Still, as far as Judaism is concerned, it is only in his last momentous work, Moses and Monotheism, that the heretical worldview of Freud, the godless Jew, as he once called himself, is openly declared. Now, Moses and Monotheism was published in England in 1939 after J Freud escaped from the Nazis. And it offers a speculative argument about the origins of the Jewish people. And I think it has a lot to uh, 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 interesting comparison with uh, uh, Chanichovsky that maybe should be mentioned. So Freud says that inspired, Freud's book is inspired by the set of important affinities uh, uh, between Judaism and a brief monotheistic episode uh, uh, in, the, in Egyptian history during the reign of Akhenaton. So the, uh, Freud theorized that while official historiographical accounts insist that this short monotheistic episode ended with the death of Akhenaton, the Egyptian religion was in fact born again in Judaism. Freud argues that one of the crown Egyptian princes named Moses, who was close to the dead Pharaoh, decided to preserve the Egyptian religion by introducing it to a slave nation that happened to live in Egypt at the time, which are the Israelites. So the Israelites were intended to save the dying Egyptian religion, the one that the Egyptians themselves rejected. So very plainly, Moses was an Egyptian prince, according to Freud, and Judaism is actually an Egyptian invention. However, this is not the end. According to Freud, Moses' great religious experiment failed. The Israelite slave, accustomed to the sensual gratification of their original polytheistic religion, could not have coped with the restriction and prohibition imposed by the Egyptian monotheism, such as the prohibition to make pictures and circumcision. And the Savad Semites therefore took fate into their own end and rid themselves of their tyrant, writes Freud. So very simply, the Jews killed Moses. Now, naturally, Freud's Moses book created quite a turmoil. Freud's claim about Moses' secret Egyptian identity and his murder in the desert by the Israelites troubled many who appealed to Freud and asked him to refrain from publishing his book in such a sensitive time for the Jewish people. Remember, 1939. To many, it seems that as if Freud uh, echoed anti-Semitic propaganda for the Jews, we are, according to Freud, the descendant of despicable slave, essentially a nation of murderers. Ernest Jones, in his biography of Freud, even recounts how friends suggested to Freud that the publication might cause hurt feelings in certain Orthodox quarters, and Freud described the same to Arnold Zweig in 1931 about an American Jew who implored him not to publish the book. So why did Freud did publish it, especially since he was quite a, an experienced public figure? And he was very well aware of that. He writes in the beginning of the book, to deprive a people of the men whom they take pride in the, great, in, in, as the greatest of their sons is not a thing to be gladly, carelessly, or carelessly undertaken least of all by someone who is himself one of them. But we cannot allow of any such uh, reflection to induce us to put the truth aside in favor of what we're supposed to be, natural interest. This is his own words from the beginning of the book. And sure enough, after the pleading, we did not, which did not change his mind, can the condemnation. Avraham Shalom Yehuda, a scholar of Jewish history, even writes in a review of the book. 
It seems to me that in these words we hear the voice of one of the most fanatical Christians in their hatred of Israel. <coughs> so in my short presentation today, I would like to rethink both Freud's book as a heretical work. And I argue that when we focus on the arguments in the book and not on the politics of its reception, we find indeed the story of heresy, but one that projects a very unexpected role to the heretic in Jewish tradition. Exactly one that aligns with what the, uh, I think uh, Professor Alter and Professor Gutschel maybe have in mind. So now to be very clear, Moses and Monothe in Moses and Monotheism, Freud indeed offers a description of the most heinous act of heresy. According to Freud, the Jewish people, Moses' people, betrayed their leader and savior, the man who took them out of Egypt, the one who made them into a people. They rejected the Jewish faith he had offered them and then went on to murder him. They later repressed the act of murder to the extent that he disappeared from the official written record that is from the Bible. You must agree that there is no greater heresy, a harsher, more radical rejection of a religious dogma. However, this is not the end of the story, and it is here in the story of the events after the murder that Freud's books become so interesting. Freud tells us that despite the murder, the Israelites were unable to forget Moses and his religion. At first, things seem to be returned to normal. And here I think Freud tells us something about, important about our own wish to return to our lives before the coronavirus pandemic. Paul argues that after the murder, the Israelites joined another religion. They allied with the second Moses in the desert, a priest from a Median religion. So the first murder Moses was replaced by a Median priest of a local god also named Moses. They chose to forget the monotheistic religion by means of another Moses, a prophet of a different god, <coughs> who allowed them to enjoy the very same things monotheism forbade. This Jewish apostasy, however, had unexpected results. After a few generations the, under the rule of the Midianite priest, the first religion, the Egyptian monotheism, the Jewish monotheism, returned and got hold of the Jewish social reality and became the official religion of the Israelites. Now, and only now, the Jewish people. And the reason for this return is the most interesting thing about Freud's story of heresy. Most importantly, Freud argues that the murder of Moses was traumatic for the Israelites. Now, I don't have time to go into more detail, but Freud borrowed from his previous book on religion, Totem and Taboo, to argue that while this murder seems to have left no traces as an act of betrayal or an act of heresy, the murder in fact created a trauma, one that was invisible at first. And this insight really changes the picture because when Freud thinks of this murder of Moses, he does so with the theory of trauma in mind, and he argues that like the trauma at the level of the individual, this collective trauma of the Israelite was also repressed. The trauma of the murder of the Jewish heresy did not disappear, as it may have seemed for a while, but was rather repressed and hidden from conscious social reality. Think of someone, of someone who suffers from a sexual drama as a child and successfully represses that trauma. However, Freud continues that like in an individual trauma that returned after a few years, so did the trauma of the murder. After a few generations under the Midianite Moses, the trauma resurfaced. And like in the individual, in returning, this trauma was more powerful than ever. So to continue the example, think of someone who engages with harmful relationship in adulthood because of sexual drama that was supposedly repressed. So the trauma got hold of the Israelites. It forced them to return to and accept the principles they had previously so fiercely renounced. The Israelites who categorically denied the religion of Moses now embraced the same religion who had a much greater psychological and emotional force. Freud writes that the Israelites were exalted, this is his words, and proud to be pe Moses' pe the chosen people. So what are the implications of this theory to our understanding of heresy? Think of that. In Freud's story of Jewish history, the traumatic experience of the murder upheld the conscious intention of the heretical Israelite. Heresy did not abrogate the validity or meaning of Moses' religion. On the contrary, 
it created the necessary psychic condition for the complete domination of Judaism on the Israelite slave. The Jewish religion became so powerful only thanks to the betrayal of the Israelites. In an early letter to May, uh, uh, from May 1935 to, his, to Lou uh, Andrea Salome, he writes this much, and I'm quoting, Religion owes their compulsive power to the return of the repressed, to the return of trauma. They are reawakened memories of very ancient, forgotten, highly emotional episodes of human history. So in Moses and Monotheism, Freud portrays the dialectical nature of heresy. For Freud, heresy instituted religious reality. Someone needs to refuse to, violent, to violently transgress and oppose the hegemony. A murder, real or imaginary, must be committed. Shame and guilt must overflow so that religion will secure us, sorry, will securely hold us from within and force us to obey. Heresy initiates for Freud the transition from formal external systems of religious norms to internal psychical domination. Up to the moment of his murder, Moses coerced the Israelites to obey. After the heretic act, they happily obeyed. Initially, the monotheistic religion was but a set of laws that would have disappeared if Moses had simply died. But because of a heresy, the monotheistic religion came to dominate the Israelites for eternity. Now, think of this message of Freud, who just escaped the Nazis, a message told in the 1930s to the Jewish public, many of them assimilated, many quite distant from any relation to Judaism, but all still so fearful. I propose that thanks to his book, Freud, the Godless Jew, defended his religion after betraying it, after his entire generation betrayed it. He showed that he and others who rejected Jewish tradition and replaced it with German secular society never truly compromised it, <coughs> I'm sorry, but rather gave it new life. It is as if Freud, facing the most difficult hour of Jewish history, proudly admitted his and his generation's heresy. However, because of his model of heresy, Freud could have also claimed that this betrayal maybe helped fortify Judaism. Freud had to tell his story, this horrific story of the murder of Moses in the desert, precisely as those troubled times facing the rise of anti-Semitism and the danger of Nazi occupation, for it was the best defense he could have invented for himself, for the Jews across Europe, and for Judaism. We have sinned, he would tell them, but because of our heresy, Judaism will survive. Because of our heresy, the Jewish tradition will thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gilad and um, Dr. Alter and Dr. Gottschall um, for these wonderful and um, stimulating presentations. Um, uh, we now have um, some time for our three present presenters to um, have a bit of a, a conversation, as it were, about the subject of Judaism and heresy. And perhaps this could be framed as um, a chance to think about the relationship between Judaism and heresy from the perspective of um, the completed work, canonization and alterity, um, and um, the question of whether the, you know, from the perspective of this completed book, there are new paths of research or questions that have um, occurred to you that would be fruitful avenues for your efforts in, in this area. Um, or we can take the conversation in, in any other um, of the directions that, uh, that may occur to you, of course. Uh, who should say something? Uh, Benjamin, <laughs> maybe you should tell us. Uh, <laughs> we're all obedient. We're all non-heretic today. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, if, if it's helpful, I, I can sort of lead with a question that occurred to me while reading your con your contributions. Um, if that would maybe be a more kind of pointed way of of starting your conversation, um, uh, I was I was fascinated by where are my notes? I was fascinated as I read all of your contributions um, uh, to read about the. 
um, different forms of transgression and boundary crossing and breaking of social conventions and shared assumptions in, in all kinds of manifold and different ways. Um, um, and the use of the notion of heresy in the volume um, as the concept that is going to unify all of them and bring them together. And this is, I guess, perhaps a question for Gilad and, and Willie, but also, I guess, uh, Dr. Alter as well. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about why this sort of, why the concept of heresy appealed to the editors so strongly as the one that is going to bring all of these forms of um, subversive behavior together? Um, and um, were there ever any other alternative um, concepts that appealed to you, um, but may have been discarded for, for different reasons? <clears throat> Maybe I'll say something. So this actually started in, in I'm not sure uh, Professor Alter knows that, but this started in a, in a conference that Professor Alter had, a small conference on heresy in Berkeley, which Vivian participated. And I attended, and I remember thinking how heresy is such a, a, is such a, 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 a huge topic that no, it's not so, it's not addressed enough in the literature about uh, Judaism, that you find a lot of discussion about heresy in Christianity. Heresy seems to be a Christian topic because it has to do with a lot of the discussion between different sects in the history of Christianity. And it doesn't seem to be a, 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 a concept, a very vital concept in Judaism. And even you think about either, and I think uh, Robert uh, Alter actually mentioned that, either, it's a question if heresy even applies to Judaism because what, what exactly heresy? Is it, is it minut? Is it kfira? It, it doesn't even have a, a very good translation to, uh, to, uh, to Hebrew. And uh, what occurred to me after attending this uh, uh, workshop is that it's actually, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's almost like uh, 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 it's calling for uh, a very serious reconsideration. And I thought, I, I, I think that for me, it, was, it appeared to be that everywhere after you're thinking about heresy, you almost cannot find it always, everywhere. And I think Vivian mentioned the different, and really mentioned the different topics that we had in mind. And it really is so diverse. It, think of that, it's, we're moving from Kafka to, uh, uh, to Tarnikovsky, from uh, uh, Freud to uh, uh, Derrida and Walter Benjamin, and there are so many, and they all have some way of thinking of heresy as something that is very productive. And for me, that was uh, um, kind of like the setting Point for a, a greater discussion that I'm very uh, happy that we we're able to uh, to offer. But that, um, Willie, maybe you have a, a different take on that. Um, yeah, I could just say quickly. I mean, one thing we 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 had conceptually to come um, to terms with <laughs> the terms is actually a good phrase here is um, well, heresy is a Christian invention in terms uh, um, of like the concept. But um, then uh, Judaism spent a lot of its life in Christ Christian eras. And so what became interesting is how uh, Jewish tradition at some point had to deal with um, two things. With one is that Christianity as a, a Jewish heresy, which is an interesting concept or a historical thing, and how then um, Judaism was uh, termed a Christian heresy at some point. And so because of that uh, back and forth, um, Jewish rabbinical tradition had to come up with some kind of a conceptual framework of in an exclusion. So heresy, the way it's discussed today is like two ways. One is you have unusual ideas or something like that, but the other one is also how the mechanism of in an exclusion functions. And what I thought was fascinating is in terms of, and that's why we chose the title canonization and alterity, because alterity is not our invention. It's like Elijah Ben Abuya was called the Alchea. So alterity is inscribed not only in the way of um, Judaism thought about exclusion, but how Elijah, Elijah was always a rabbi also and is actually included. It's like at the, he's a constitutive moment of Jewish tradition. Like if you would take him away, you would not have Jewish tradition as we know it. 
And so I thought that was something I, I thought was really interesting, how we can look at it um, that way. And, um, um, but it made it a little bit more complex because we had to, to look at it. And at, at some point, uh, one of the interesting moments I had is when we realized that in the 15th century or 16th, the, concept, the term heresy was assimilated interestingly into Jewish tradition by um, going back to a Hebrew wording, which is almost literally phonemically playing with the word heresia, um, but like um, in, because there's a biblical moment where um, th that sound event happens, um, and then how um, in the Middle Ages, later Renaissance, early modernity, um, heresy becomes a real concern. And that's not unusual. It would be later Renaissance, early modernity when things get streamlined. Um, and so I thought it's a wonderful idea to think about how canons are working, which is something is I'm very interested in, especially, and how uh, at canons are produced actually at least in Jewish tradition, with including what it excludes. Um, you have a similar um, effect, um, history or moment in Christianity, but it, where uh, without the heresiological tradition, Christianity wouldn't be what it is. But what is interesting is they are on the ground level slightly different how they operate. And so we couldn't really use, um, we had to sort of reinvent the wheel a little bit as, as we tried to do this. And that was interesting. And the other part was what Vivian said at the beginning, it was a lot of fun to see a historian like Eric Grun saying, you know, Hel Hellenism was not um, a heresy, it was part of the active Jewish life, which connects precisely what uh, Robert Alter says about Chernikovsky. So you have a tradition there, um, that interweaves and eventually what may, what's so interesting is how traditions are so much more complex than what we think they are. So I think that's what really uh, kept us moving uh, on this project. Yeah, uh, I would like to pose a question to Gilad. Um, before I do, for the curiosity of our viewers, uh, I want to say something about the, the uh, distant origins of this project, for which I, I take a certain credit. That, that is, Vivian and I have participated in a, a number of sessions of a consortium that involves her university, Princeton, and the Hebrew University. Um, and um, it, at, at each of these meetings, a particular biblical text was chosen, and then various perspectives on the text itself and on the reception of the text over time were proposed by, by the speakers. So after one such session at Princeton, Vivian and I, uh, I think Ilana Pardes was sitting there to chatted about future possibilities and uh, I said, well, instead of doing a biblical text, why don't we sometime do um, uh, Jewish heresy? And uh, they latched on to the idea, uh, and that uh, resulted in, in uh, the, the meeting of the consortium in Berkeley, where um, uh, Gilad was present. So, so much for the, the background. Now, as Gilad spoke about Freud and gave a very cogent and vivid uh, account of Freud's view of um, Moses and heresy, uh, a thought occurred to me, and I, I wonder, Gilad, if you want to comment on this. It seems to me that what Freud did and what uh, Chernochowski did a rather different in kind. That is, uh, Freud produced a kind of um, historical fiction uh, to bolster his theories, uh, full of uh, uh, fantastic ideas 
that have no historical evidence and that certainly over all these decades have not been accepted by the Guild of Biblical Scholars. And I don't quite consider myself part of that guild. I'm a kind of interloper. Um, Chernichovsky, on the other hand, uh, linked up with uh, something actually in the air, in the experience of ancient Israel, and hinted at or even spelled out in the prophets, for example, uh, about the pervasiveness of other beliefs in, in ancient Israel. So Gilad, I'm curious if you want to make anything out of that contrast. Yeah, I, I thought, I, I thank you. I, I appreciate the question. I think that Freud would disagree with you. I think that one thing that is fascinating about Freud is that he hold, held on on his theory of the totem and, and his theory of modus and monotheism and regarded that as the truth. The only thing that he's, he thinks is that we are unable to understand this truth because we are captured with what's written and what's in the stone. And he says this is a, uh, this is, a, in a psychological term, this is the conscience level of the history. We are used to live in a, in a history that has some concrete manifestations, but they are, he says, something that we are consciously making. But he's saying the fact of the murder of the Moses is something that I can decipher because I can think psychoanalytically about, uh, um, about the past, and I can detect from the stories about the the same way I can detect from stories of a person something that happened that he's unaware of and something that he has repressed. And because of that, I can say something that is from, uh, fundamentally different from the story that he's given me. I can do the same to history. And there is a, such a huge discussion about that because he's really saying that history as a discipline is a very... Uh, uh, misguided, not misguided, but certainly something, a partial way to understand what happened in history. And the fact that he had so many people going after him and, and arguing against him, especially with the totem uh, book, and saying to him that there are no evidence, he never uh, uh, returned, he never kind of like caved in and he insisted on that. He even said something that is really fascinating. He said, there is no an objective truth that will go and change and, and and make me change my mind because I'm not talking on objective truth. I'm talking about psychological truth. And in a sense, for Freud, and I think this is maybe the most fascinating aspect, is the question if Moses was killed in the desert or not, itself as an historical fact, is not as important. He would say, even if you didn't kill Moses, like literally killing the person, but you have this fantasy of killing Moses, that will be enough to create a, a, a huge uh, social and, and religious uh, implication because it's the same way that human beings have a desire and, and, and wish and unconscious wishes that they're never actually made, uh, um, made explicit in reality, but still has such a powerful force on us. And I think that's, so in a sense, he's really have a very different understanding of what is truth and what is false and how you you need to mitigate that and and in that sense uh, 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 i think uh, uh, he's maybe even closer to more, more closer to johnny hofke than we appreciate that in the sense of this poetic way of thinking of history that really is diverting from the objectiveness of, or the objectivity that we're looking for in historical uh, uh sciences yeah. well i'd like to respond uh and this is something that, that's been said about Freud by quite a few people, is that he set up a game in which he could never lose. That, that is, uh, if you're saying something that's counter what he's saying, then you're repressing something. Uh, or or um, your um, superego is transforming it. And um, what I would like to observe that there's a kind of heresy that constitutes itself as a counter orthodoxy. And I really think that's true of Freudianism. I mean, e even in the, the circle around him that gathered around him in Vienna, you can see 
it was constituted as a kind of church. A and if you diverged, you were uh, thrown out. And it it's actually an aspect of, of Freud that I am personally uncomfortable with. That's, that's a great comment. Uh, I would all say, say that you're absolutely uh, correct. Um, yeah, there is even, a, 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 there was a, just to shortly remark, there was a, a, an exhibition in the Israeli Museum of the rings that Freud would give to, uh, like rings that are made of coins of, of, uh, of pagan myth, like of, of pagan gods. And these rings, will, he, will give, he gave something like 20 of them, and they signified the fact that someone is part of his group. So if you want like to think right. about heresy. <laughs> That's a beautiful group. example. <laughs> there is no heresy greater than giving someone a ring of a, of a god. And, and, and he gave them according to how he perceived them. And if you're just moving just a bit from what you were given as a god, as to be part of the group, you were expelled immediately. So I, I agree with you. That's a good point. In the interests of keeping the agenda going and making sure we get to all the different um, moving parts of the event, um, we have an upcoming um, Q&A with the audience, but I first wanted to offer um, uh, Jill Max an opportunity to make a brief announcement on behalf of the Baltimore Hebrew Institute. Thank you, Ben. Um, good evening, everyone. I am the director of Baltimore Hebrew Institute at Towson University. I'd first really like to thank uh, Dr. Anna Sternses and our partners at the Ann Tannenbaum Center at the University of Toronto uh, for this one, helping us to put on this wonderful event. And I also really want to thank Diane Siegel and Lauren Fedua for all of their behind the scenes work on making these Zoom things possible. And of course, to our wonderful panelists, Professor Robert Alter, Professor Willie Gertschel, and Professor Gilad Charbit, and, and our wonderful moderator, Professor Ben Fisher. Uh, this year, because we are all in this Zoom world, we are focusing on our faculty, and our faculty have been very productive over the last year, and we're really excited to bring their work out to the world. So we just want to thank everyone for being here.